Well, good evening. So good to be with you. I don't know if you saw the original schedule, but my name was not on it. Uh, Ty called me about uh, a week and a half ago, and he said, hey, we've had a few drop out, and um, we need some guys to fill in on our series. Is there any way you could take one of these dates? And um, I had hip replacement surgery three weeks ago today. And so I had cleared my schedule for this uh, time to recover, and I happened to be feeling pretty good. And I said, well, sure, I'll give it a shot. Hadn't even gone back to Stony Point at that point. So I was uh, banking on the fact that I would feel good enough to be here. So uh, I'm thankful for the invitation. Always, always enjoy being here and love the people here. And uh, just so thankful uh, for that. Um, I know it's hot. This is one of those times of the year where it seems like um, it's, it's hotter than it ought to be. And uh, holiday week at that. And um, so a lot of people are traveling, a lot of people are at camp. And uh, so we just appreciate you being here. We were in the Yucatan, Mexico about three and a half weeks ago. And it was 105 with a heat index of 113 every day. And so that broke us in pretty good to what we would come back home to. Uh, we actually were cold the first night we came home after being down there all week. So, so it, it's, it's hot, but it could be worse. And so, um, again, thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing me to be here. I love the theme. I love the fact that we're looking at songs. We're looking at lyrics and what they teach us and, and what, what songs mean to us. And if you have looked into the songs in our songbook that we sing and have sung for many years, you'll find that there's a pretty neat background to, to many of them about either how they were written, uh, how they came about, or the circumstances surrounding that song. And uh, when I asked Ty uh, what was still available, I couldn't believe it because this one is one of my favorite and favorite ones to talk about. So tonight we're going to talk about the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And uh, as we do, let's realize that singing is a very big part of life for a Christian. You know, some of you may love singing, and some of you may just say, I have a terrible voice and you don't ever try to sing. <laughs> but whatever the case is, we all know that every week, we sing praises to God as part of our activities, and, um, and many times we sing during the week at different times. Matter of fact, I've been singing this song just about all day because I've been studying about it and, and um, just had it in my mind. So when Christy was out of the house, I was belting it out really loud because I didn't want her making fun of me. So we have so many good songs that we sing, and they all have a great message. They're meant to magnify God and to help us teach and admonish one another. Um, and again, they have great messages, many of them, uh, because of, of the, again, the, the aim is to, to teach us more Bible or more about God. Colossians 3 and verse 16 talks about the fact that we're to teach and admonish one another as we sing. And so as we go about singing, let's realize that we actually teach one another as we praise God and encourage one another to that end. Um, so that's what we do. We are people that praise God. We are people that like singing. But let me ask you a question as we start to get into this topic and the lyrics that we're going to be looking at tonight. You know, when life is good, it's easy to praise God, isn't it? When things are going great, uh, when health is good, when family is good, when money is good, and there's no problems, no bumps in the road, man, Praise God. It's, it's a great time to sing praises to God, and you feel so good about it. But this is the question I have for you as we begin. How easy is it for you to praise God when things are not going good? A lot of people find it difficult. A lot of people have a little challenge to praise God because we have kind of an unreal expectation that as Christians, God is going to protect us from all problems. And that we should have a problem-free life just because we serve God. I mean, if you think about it, if we're close to our Creator and we have this good relationship with Him, it kind of makes sense to us that He would protect us uh, from all harm. It's kind of like when I was in middle school. Uh, 
I hadn't hit a growth spurt at one point, and I had this big friend of mine that would hang out with me, and I always enjoyed hanging out with him because as long as I was close to him, nobody messed with me because they were scared to death of him. And if I was his friend, then I was in good shape, right? Well, we kind of look at God that way. We think, well, if God is, is my friend and I have a relationship with him and I'm praising him every week and I'm serving him, then surely he's going to make everything okay. He's going to make everything smooth for me. But you know, that's not what we read, is it? When we read about God's people, do we find them having problems? Obviously so. You find them having, matter of fact, more problems sometimes because they are serving God. You know, you think about the persecution that Jesus promised to his followers, that it will come, that that will be a part of their, their life, that they expect it. Not only that, but just the fact that we are in a fallen world, and we're subject to sickness and problems, uh, arthritis that takes your hip away before you, you know, turn 55, uh, that runs in your family, things like that, or even worse. You know, we have so many people around us that are sick, even our prayer list on the bulletin, it never gets shorter. There's always somebody asking for us to pray for them. And so we all understand that, don't we? But we still have that idea that surely God ought to fix it. It ought to work out. So it's easy to praise God when things are going well, but not so easy sometimes when it's not. So we might even wonder, is God really hearing my prayer? Why is it God fixing this problem? Why, why is this ongoing? And you have so many people praying, and you have so many you know, situations where you think, surely God is going to make this work out good. And then a lot of times it doesn't. And so we, we sometimes question, is God close by? Is He really a God that cares? No, is God always good? Well, I think we all, if we've been Christians long enough, can say, God is good no matter what. No matter what our circumstances are, God is going to be good. But again, it's, it's put to the test during those difficult times. And so, as we think about a fellow that I want to tell you about tonight named Horatio Spafford. He was a, a lawyer uh, in the Chicago area back in 1871. And um, he was successful, had a lot of investments downtown. And then came the big Chicago fire that devastated all of that area of Chicago where he had investments, uh, ended up killing 300 people, leaving 100,000 people homeless. And so here he is taking a big loss, but yet he goes into that community and he helps those needy people and tries to help them get back on their feet. And this he does for about two years. And finally, they get to the point where they say, our family needs a vacation. And so they decided they would go to England. They were going to be a part of a, a church campaign over there. And then they were going to see some of Europe. And so right at the last minute, right before they boarded the ship, Ratio Spafford had a call that came in about some business that he had to tend to. So he put his wife and his four daughters on the ship and sent them ahead, and he was going to catch the next one and catch up with them by the next day. A few hours later, he got a telegraph, telegram that just simply said from his wife, saved alone. You see, that ship ended up running into another ship, and it sank. And his wife was able to cling to a piece of the wood from the boat, and she was able to be rescued but their four daughters drowned in the Atlantic Ocean. And obviously this was tragic news for him. Here his wife is alone mourning the loss of their four daughters. By the way, they had lost their only son about two years before this. And so now he quickly boards a ship and tries to catch up with his wife in England so that he can be by her side as they mourn the loss of their four daughters. And as they were sailing across the ocean, he took out a pen and started to write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, 
it is well with my soul. Now when we look at the story behind that song and how it was written, and as he is traveling right through the section of the ocean where his daughters perished, and he's writing these words, we all have to wonder how in the world does this man have that strong of faith? How is this man able to say it is well with my soul when he's just lost his four daughters? How can he do that? It's an amazing thing as we look at, at his situation, as we look at that song. And I can tell you, this is one of my favorite songs. Uh, even before I knew the history to it, I've always loved this song. It's just one of those that kind of gives you chill bumps when you sing it and it's, and it's you know, sung with, with a lot of people singing along with you. And uh, it's a very moving song. But it's even more moving when you hear the background, when you know the situation, the terms from which it came. It's just completely amazing to know that. And so here's a man who's a great example to all of us about how to deal with life storms. When life is difficult, when life is not easy, when things happen that are very tragic, he is still able to praise God. And he wrote one of the most moving songs that we sing in our worship. In Psalm 34, you have a situation that's kind of similar with David. David's been through a lot in his life. And uh, in verse 2, it says, My soul shall make... Uh, it's boast in the Lord. And the NIV says, and the afflicted hear and rejoice. You think about it, the afflicted. And as you read this whole psalm, you find that many times it talks about the afflictions of the righteous. Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. Look at verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So it reminds us that, again, we're not immune to any of these problems, that we're going to have afflictions, we're going to have pain, we're going to suffer to some degree. But the difference, and I think this is what Horatio Spafford saw, and I think this is what David saw, is that life with its problems are so much easier to deal with when you have a relationship with God than when you don't. And that plays out in life. I can tell you as a preacher... I've been to the funeral home many times. And a lot of times it's because one of our members have died or somebody who's related to them has died. And, uh, and I go to visitations, funerals. And every now and then we'll have a funeral that is somebody who's not a Christian or has a family who just needs a preacher to, to step in and help them because they don't go to church anywhere. And I've done several of those funerals. And I can tell you that the people grieve differently of those who aren't Christians than those who have Christian loved ones. You can tell that there is a sadness because their loved one has passed, and yet there is a joy knowing that they're in a better place. But for those who have no hope, those who are not in Christ, you can tell that they weep and weep and weep because they just don't have that hope of a reunion in the future. They don't have that assurance that all will work out one day. And so that's the challenge that, that we many times have in this life. But yet, again, we have Jesus in our lives. And that's what makes all the difference. One more thing, and then I want to give you three things that may help us to have that same peace, just like Horatio Spafford had as he wrote that song. Philippians chapter 4, familiar scripture to all of us. When it comes to prayer, when it comes to difficult times, just reminding us that even when things are difficult, we can be at peace. Verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but by everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So he talks about a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's what we look at. When we see a man writing the song after the tragic events that he experienced, this man can have peace that surpasses all understanding. Nobody gets it. <laughs> Nobody can comprehend. How can he be that way? How can he rejoice in the midst of a difficult time? And I would dare say that many would look at us as Christians and wonder that about us 
And, and it's an opportunity for us, for us to, to show them the peace that they could have if they had the same relationship with God that we do. Back to the song, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's a description of peace, is it not? It tells us, even in the first line, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, you can just see him looking out the window and seeing the ocean and the waves and knowing that that churning is what he's feeling. And yet he still says he can have peace in the midst of it. Well, that's what we're after, isn't it? We all would love peace. And when difficult times come, that's what the goal is. And so how can we have peace? And, and what does it produce according to this song? What we're going to do is use the lyrics here to help us to understand uh, a little bit more about this peace that surpasses all understanding. The first thing I want you to remember is that you can have peace during trials. That's basically what we've been talking about up to this point. That, that peace is right, really not based on circumstances. It's something that comes from within. Matter of fact, you remember that Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 is in the midst of a storm in a boat with his disciples. And what is he doing? He's asleep. You know, the disciples are running around. You know, Lord, Lord, wake up. We're about to perish. <laughs> Even one of them says, do you not care that we're about to die? And yet Jesus is at peace. He's asleep. We might say, well, that's Jesus, obviously. He knows what he's about to do. But I think that's an example of the fact that even in the midst of a terrible situation, he's calm. There's no panic. You don't ever see Jesus panic about anything, do you? You always see this calmness, this peace about him, and the way he deals with things. And again, we chalk it up many times to him being the Son of God. But we have to also look at it in the fact that we can have that same peace that he's described with that same relationship with his God that we have with him. So when you think about Psalm 46 in verse 1, that's one of the ones that a lot of times we go to during times of trouble. And it tells us that Jesus is our, or that, that the Lord is our refuge. He said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Again, going back to trouble coming our way as Christians. We tend to think there should be a wall up that should protect us. But you know, over and over, the Bible tells us that God doesn't keep us from having difficulties. But what does He do? He's with us in those difficulties. And, and really, if you think about the type of people we are as human beings, would we ever really cling to God if we ever just went through life with no problem? Would we ever appreciate the good times without the bad times? Would we ever really pray intently if we weren't hurting at times? I mean, think about it. When do you pray the hardest? When, when there's difficulty, when you're hurting, when somebody in your family's hurting, when there's a situation that, uh, that we want God to intervene. I mean, we pray and pray about those matters. And so that's what helps us to seek God as our refuge. And again, if God is saying, I'm your refuge and a help during trouble, that implies that trouble is going to come and that you're going to need a refuge, doesn't it? And so that's why when we look at um, having peace in the midst of trials and difficulties, we know that God has promised that He would be with us. You know, you probably remember this, but in 2005, my first wife passed away of cancer. She had had... Uh, brain tumors that started uh, three and a half years earlier. Uh, we went through all kinds of surgeries and treatments and um, rehab, and um, she would get better for a little while, and then it'd get worse, and it'd come back. She had three different brain tumors grow back in the same place, and eventually it just kept coming back worse and worse, and we knew we weren't going to be able to overcome it that last time. And so uh, for the last Two or three months, uh, we just did our best to appreciate life, to spend the time with each other that we could, and, um, and be realistic about it. We didn't talk a lot about it just because, you know, we didn't want to be sad all the time, but we did talk about it in a realistic way. And I remember she helped me so much because she said, I'm not afraid to die. 
I just don't want to leave you and the kids. And, and I knew that, you know, and we, at that point, Courtney was seven, Braxton was five. Uh, he had just started kindergarten. She was in, uh, I think, third grade. And so here we are with two little kids. But, you know, I, I told her, I said, we'll be okay. You know, we, we'll, we'll make it. But um, just want you to, you know, do the best you can with what time we have. And so on November the 10th, 2005, at age 33, she passed away. You know, in, in a few months after that, I had one of our members, I was preaching at Northport at that point. She was actually a neighbor of mine too. And uh, her father had had cancer. And uh, we had been praying for him while we were praying for my wife. You know, we had hundreds, maybe thousands of people praying for both of them. And she came by my house one day and she said, Brad, I have a question for you. She said, I'm struggling. She said, we had so many people praying for my dad and for your wife, and neither one of them lived. And she looked at me and she said, does prayer really matter? Does it really matter? And, and I knew that feeling. I knew what she meant, even though I was not where she was, because I knew prayer mattered, and I knew that you know, some people end up passing away in spite of all the prayers and all the efforts. That's just where we are, again, in this world. But she was struggling spiritually with that because she wondered, does God really care about me? Does God really hear all these people praying, and why didn't he intervene? And you've probably either been there or talked to somebody who's been there. And I know it's a difficult situation to be in because those doubts creep in. But I was able to, to talk with her from my perspective and just simply say, you know, God is always listening, and God always loves us, and God is always good. No matter what happens, no matter what He allows to happen, or what He doesn't stop, God is always good. And so we have to look at it from that perspective, that, that maybe sometimes there's a reason for that. Maybe that's part of God's plan for something. And sometimes it's just simply because of where we are in this fleshly body. And so after we talked, I think it, it helped her get out of that hole that she was in. But nevertheless, that's where some folks get when things are difficult. And they don't have that peace that we're talking about. And so we want to make sure that, that we help everybody understand that even when God doesn't intervene and God doesn't do what we want Him to do, He still cares and He's still good. And so first of all, you can have peace if you continue to rely on God and know that He does care. I mean, think about it. You, you have examples of, of Jesus allowing His best friend Lazarus to die. And, and the sisters, Mary and Martha, coming to Him said, Lord, if you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. Do you, do you feel like they said that with a big smile on their face? Do you think they had some questions for Jesus? I mean, was there not a big question mark at the end of of that statement, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. What was the question? Where were you? Why didn't you show up? He waited, what, four days. Lazarus has been in the tomb four days when he shows up. He's too late. A lot of people even question him. Could this man that gave sight to the blind not have saved this fellow from dying? So again, example after example, the fact that sometimes they don't, everybody's not granted what they wished. Not everybody is saved from sickness or death. Matter of fact, if you look at the healing of the man at the pool where supposedly the angel stirred the water and the first one in got healed, Jesus ended up healing that man, didn't he? Maybe you've watched watch The Chosen. You see that scene? It's really a neat scene. And, um, and so there he is, and, and it says multitudes of people were gathered around this pool hoping to, to be healed. And I asked my class at Mars Hill this question when we studied this. How many people did Jesus heal that day at that pool? They look at it for a minute. They say, one. And I said, well, it says multitudes were gathered there of sick folks. They look and they say, yeah. And I say, why didn't he heal them? 
Well, that's a question a lot of times that fits right into what we're talking about. God does what He wants to do on His timetable for His purpose and for His glory, and we are the ones that just have to live by faith. We trust Him. It's kind of like Job said, though He slay me, yet I will trust in Him. That's got to be the attitude that we have as Christians. And, and we know that it'll, it'll all work out for good because that's the promise. And so first of all, you can have peace during trials. You can also, number two, have peace because of forgiveness. Going back to the lyrics of the song, he says, My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Now, you just want to sing that part, don't you? You just want to sing it because that's, that's one of those moving lines of that song where you just almost get up on your toes when you're singing that. And you think about it. My sin, not just in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Matter of fact, Colossians chapter 1 reminds us of that very truth. The fact that we all know that as Christians, that Jesus came here to seek and to save the lost. He gave his life uh, for an atonement for our sins. But here, notice in verse 13, he says, uh, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so a reminder, in many places in the New Testament, it tells us because of the blood of Jesus, we're all forgiven if we obey the gospel. And here we have that blessing. And because we are forgiven, we can have peace. Because if we think about it, sin separates us from our God, and therefore it, the fellowship is not there. And that's what we've been talking about of how important that is, not only in, in bad times, but also in good times, to be able to walk with God every day. There's a group called Casting Crowns, and I'm sure many of you have heard them. They have a line in one of their songs that, I know it's not Bible, but I think it's true. That it's, They sing the song and it says, God looks at us if we, as if we had never sinned. If we've been covered by the blood of Jesus, when God looks at you, He looks at it you as if you had never sinned. Isn't that amazing? That's what forgiveness is. That's why we have fellowship with God. You know, one sin separates us from God. And so to be righteous, we can't be righteous of ourselves. We had to have Jesus and His righteousness bestowed upon us. And so because we're covered by the blood, because we have gained the righteousness of Christ in our lives, that's what God sees in us. He sees us as perfect. Now, we don't feel that way, do we? <laughs> I can tell you right off, even as a preacher, I feel like God gets wore out with me. I feel like I stumble and I sin, maybe in the same areas over and over, and I feel like this is the you know, 700,000th time I've come before God about the same sin and asking for forgiveness, and He still forgives me. But yet, a lot of times we feel unworthy of that forgiveness, and yet... His forgiveness is so complete and so whole that as long as we walk in light as He is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from all sin, as 1 John 1 reminds us. And so, in the second place, you can have peace because you're forgiven. And that's something that I think that, that comes about when, um, when you're a Christian that you understand that other people don't. I heard a preacher one time, I like to listen to a lot of different ones since we have the privilege of technology these days. And so this guy out in Texas, he was a preacher and he was talking about his mom. She was about to go back for surgery and, and uh, it was pretty tricky surgery. Didn't know how it was going to come out. And so he went and prayed with his mom right before she went back to surgery. And, and she looked at him and she said, son, he said, you know that I'm going to be okay either way. You know, and, and he looked at her and he said that was the reality of his mom's faith that hit him like a ton of bricks. She looked at him and said, whether I live or whether I die, it's going to be okay. And that's what Christians can do because we know we're forgiven. We know where we're going if we die. And we can have that peace of mind. 
I talk to, I kind of do this anytime that I'm going to have something done. I remind everybody of where all the important papers are <laughs> and how much they get if I die because I'm worth a whole lot more money dead than alive. <laughs> and um, so Courtney and, and maybe one of the other kids was home and uh, she said, okay. She said, I want to talk about this, but remind me. We were about to get on plane, go to Mexico. And we, as soon as we got back, I was having surgery. So a bunch of events where, you know, I might not make it back from one of those things. So here we are. We're talking about all that. And, um, you know, Courtney jokingly said, now, how much do we get if you're not? And then she said, I'm just kidding. You know, so we're, we're talking about all that. But, you know, when you think about it, those are the things that a lot of times people worry about. But but I think we all talked about it and said, hey, either way, we're good. If our plane crashes, what better place to crash than on the way to or from a mission trip, right? And surgery, you know, my surgeon was a fella who came in and prayed with me before he took me back. And boy, that, you feel good about a surgeon who's, who's ready to pray before he starts operating. And so, you know, that meant a lot. And so that's the peace that we have as Christians, because we are forgiven. Then the third and last thing, you can have peace because you have a future home. And we've already talked about that a little bit, the fact that we know where we're going. But notice the lyrics. Lord, haste the day, hasten the day, when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And we start picturing that, don't we? We think about the events of the, the day of the Lord when He comes back again. And, and, and a lot of times when we're in trouble, when we have difficulty, we'll pray that, won't we? I remember my first wife, the beach was kind of one of those places we'd go to kind of relax and get away from all of our trouble. And the last time we went was in August before she died in November. And I remember we were down there and it was a beautiful sunset. And she just looked at me and she said, I just wish the Lord had come back right now. I just wish he'd come back right now. And that was before her last surgery and such. We didn't know really what we were dealing with completely. We just knew more trouble was on the horizon. You know, and I thought about it and I thought, that's what we all really look forward to is the time where we can escape all the problems of this world, all the hurts and all the pains. And anytime we're in a, a spot like that, Lord, come quickly. Now, when we're not right with God, we don't say that. <laughs> we're not really ready for that. But you know, if, we, if we're walking with Him every day, we look forward to His coming back. And the reason is because we know where we're going. And um, Peter writes to a group of folks who are being persecuted, beat up, uh, some of them losing their lives. And so it's easy for you to get discouraged in a spot like that, isn't it? And so notice how Peter starts his letter to the folks who are being persecuted. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. He said, you've got a reservation with your name on it. It's there in heaven can't be taken away from you. And so with that, we think about heaven. We think about the surety that we have, that Jesus is, is that guarantee, and the Spirit is the guarantee that we have that salvation. But here, even the words of Peter and the words of Jesus, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, where, where I am, there may you be also. John chapter 14. And then Romans 8 18, I love the scripture because it says that, he says, I reckon in the King James, it makes him sound like a southerner. He says, I reckon the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In other words, what we go through here is just very minute compared to what the reward is going to be. We may suffer a little, we may be uncomfortable, we may go through some hard times, but it'll all be worth it. We'll all get through it, and we'll all have that blessing that God has for us on that one day that we all look forward to. And that's the day he was writing about. Lord, hasten the day when my faith will turn in the sight. We see him through the eye of faith, but one day we'll see him 
face to face. That almost gives you chills to think about, doesn't it? That one day, reality will be, we'll be with God. And that's the best part of heaven. It's not the streets of gold or the gates of pearl. It's not even the benefits of no sickness, no pain, no death, no sorrow. The fact that we'll be in the presence of the one who is good. That's why hell is going to be terrible. Is because you're removed from the very source and the one who is good. And so we have that hope and we have that future. And we look forward to going there one day. And that brings us peace because, again, just like the lady going back for surgery, whether we live or whether we die, we have the peace to know everything's going to be okay. So I hope this song means more to you the next time you sing it, knowing the circumstances surrounding its writing. But also, apart from that, just the fact that anytime we go through a situation like he did, that we can still cling to God and know that He's there for us. Tonight, we extend the invitation to you. If you need to make your life right with God as a Christian, you always have the opportunity to come back to Him. He's always standing ready to forgive. He doesn't force you to do that, but He's always open, just like the prodigal son. He came home, and He was waiting on Him there. He never went into the far country to find that son, but He was always waiting on Him to come home. So if you need to come home tonight, we'd love to pray with you. If you need to be baptized, become a Christian, we'd love to see you do that as well. So tonight, if we can help you with any need, we invite you to stand and sing this invitation song.